Take your Bibles this morning and turn to the New Testament book of Colossians. Many of you know we're in a series on Sunday mornings walking through this New Testament letter to the church from Paul to the church at Colossae. And the theme of this letter, the theme of this book in the New Testament is Jesus first. Jesus must be first in every area of your life. If, if you were to come to me and you'd say, Pastor, I'm trying to figure out what it means to live a Christian life. I'm trying to figure out what it means. How am I supposed to be faithful? How am I supposed to follow God? Can you give me one sentence? And if I were to think and to pray about it, I think the one sentence that I would say, if you want to be faithful, if you want to follow Christ, Jesus must be first in everything. Jesus must be first in everything, in your marriage, in your family, in your work, at church, in your home, in every area of your life. Jesus must be first. And that really does make all the difference. And this is what the text of Scripture is teaching us as Paul's writing to a church to remind them that Jesus must not just be prominent in their lives, he must be preeminent in their lives. He doesn't just deserve part of your life. He deserves to be first in your life. And Paul has showed us that when we come to Christ, our life is changed. We are completely and totally transformed. We're made new. We're different. The mystery of the gospel is that it changes everything about us. Remember, Jesus changes everything. Even our everyday relationships. And this is where Paul finds, this is where Paul speaks to us today here in Colossians chapter 3 verses 18 through chapter 4 and verse 1. Because Paul hits us right where we are, right where we live, right where our lives are. He comes to us and he tells us that Jesus changes everything. He changes everything about us, even our marriages, even our children, even our parenting, even the way we work. Jesus changes everything about us. And so this morning from Colossians 3, verse 18 to chapter 4 and verse 1, I want to talk with you about this subject, relationships that work. Paul's been laying a foundation, teaching us a lot of doctrine, a lot of theology. And now he, he takes, really turns a corner and teaches us how all of this doctrine and theology will change the way we live with one another the way we relate to one another. Begin reading with me, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18. We'll read to chapter 4 and verse 1. Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything, those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters. Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Remember, God's word is perfect. It speaks to us right where we are and has the power to change our lives. Pray with me. Father, now take your word and I pray you'd speak to us. I pray that you would teach us in each and every area of our lives what it means like means to put Jesus first. What it looks like to follow Christ supremely. Remind us that, that you, as Lord of our lives, don't just claim part of who we are, but you claim the whole, and you deserve complete and total obedience. And from your word, we ask that you would speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, many of you are familiar with this game. It's a game called Jenga. Have you ever heard of Jenga before? Let me see your hands. Show of hands. Who's heard of Jenga? It's a really fun game. I'll explain it to you very quickly. Jenga is a game, and it comes with all sorts of parts and pieces, and the parts and pieces are built into a tower. 
The tower is made of little blocks that look just like what I'm holding in my hand. What Paul has been doing in this letter is he's been building a foundation. And he's been building a doctrinal foundation that leads us to some rea relational realities and truths. And so what he's done is he's kind of uh, building one thing on top of another. The game Jenga is really interesting. You're supposed to stack it up high, just like this. And the goal is to make sure you're not the one who knocks down the tower. Here's how you play. As many people could play. In fact, we could all come play Jenga today if you wanted to. But we're not going to do that because I'm preaching a sermon. All right? So you could, uh, the goal is you have to find one of these and you have to knock out the bottom. And you're not supposed to touch the entire stack. You just pull one of these out and make sure the whole thing doesn't fall. It's pretty good, right? Here's, here's the catch. You have to put this back on top, and at some point or another, the tower is going to fall. If you're the one pulling the block when the tower falls, you lose. It's a game called Jenga. My kids play this game. I saw somebody in Sunday school this morning in, in second or third grade playing Jenga. It's a great game. And here's what we do. I want you to know what Paul's been doing. Paul's laid a strong foundation. I mean, he's put some two-by-fours down, okay? He's put some cinder blocks down, and he's saying, this is how you to live your life. Here's the foundation. But a lot of us find out, as we walk through life, we remove some of the blocks and some of the foundation. So this is what happens. We begin to pull something out, and we begin to say, well, you know, the Bible does say that Jesus should be first in my life, but I'm, I'm really busy right now. The Bible does say that I should memorize the Word, but I just don't have time. The Bible does say that, that I ought to share my faith, but it just makes me nervous. I, I don't know if I could do that. The Bible does say that they ought to read the Word and pray on a regular basis. The Bible does say this, and so what we do is we begin to remove the, the foundational blocks to our Christianity, and this is what happens. We begin to remove them, and the tower falls down. And the problem is, many of our lives look just like this. And we want all the truth for all the stuff on top. We want to know how to have a good marriage. We want to know how to be good parents, good husbands, good wives, good moms, good dads. We want to know how to get along in life. And all we're doing is dealing with the stuff that comes on top. Because we've removed all the stuff at the bottom. We've removed all the God stuff. And we want the right people stuff. But listen, it never, ever works that way. It never works that way. If we are going to be the children of God that he's called us to be. I mean, if we want relationships that work, we have to make sure that the first relationship in our lives is right. That's our relationship with God. We get frustrated. We get angry with God when our lives look like this mess. All the while, he's told us the right things to do, the right way to live, and the right foundation to put in place to follow Christ faithfully and obediently. And so some of us walk around and this is how we feel our lives are. They're, they're falling apart. They're, they're crumbling. They're messed up. They're mixed up. It's like a Jenga game that's already done. It's falling apart. And God says, I want to remind you. And this is what Paul's been doing in this letter. So remarkable. Some fabulous truths about how Jesus must be first in everything. If you want a good marriage, make sure Jesus is first. If you want a good relationship with your children, put Jesus first. If you want a good relationship at work, put Jesus first. You know, all the problems that we face in society can be traced back to people who are just incapable of getting along. Do you know that? In the words of that famous theologian, Rodney King, why can't we all get along? You remember that? Why can't we all get along? It's because we're always dealing with surface issues instead of root causes. If there are problems in your marriage, the issues are not out on the surface. They're at the root. If there are problems in parenting, the problem with children, problems at work, or problems with others, the issues are deeper than what you can see. But so many people go through life and their lives look like a jumbled mess because they're continually pulling out the planks at the bottom. I don't have time for God. I'm too busy with work. I'm too busy in my marriage. Things are so crazy. And you pull them out one at a time, one by one, and your life falls apart. And you're shocked. And you're mad. And you blame God. God says, if you'd lived the way I taught you to live in the first place, your life wouldn't look like that. 
This is exactly what Paul is teaching us right here in Colossians chapter 3 to the beginning of Colossians chapter 4. He's given us a strong theological foundation and this leads to radical relational truths. And so let's see what Paul says to us about how we ought to live, how we ought to have relationships that work. Number one, we see in the first two verses, number one challenge we're given, embrace God's model for marriage. Embrace God's model for marriage. So one of those, one of those top issues, one of the things that we can really register, that we can really measure, are we living life in such a way that we bring honor and glory to God even in the way we relate to our husband, we relate to our wife, we relate to our spouse? Are we living life in such a way that it radically transforms even the most fundamental institution, our marriage? I mean, you can't get much more practical than that. I would venture to say that most of you here today know whether or not you have a good marriage or a bad marriage. You know if your marriage is working or if it's not. And if it is, great. I believe it's because you've followed some proper principles in the Word. But if it's not, it's not because your wife won't listen or your husband just speaks to you in grunts. It's not because, listen, it's not because of all these surface things. It's because we don't follow God's path. His purpose and His principles for relationships. We need to learn to embrace God's model for marriage. You see, Paul says here, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Now, these days, we think that Paul's teaching on marriage is outdated and antiquated. The fact that wives should submit to husbands, many women today think that this is an old-fashioned truth. But I want to remind you of something very essential, very important. The Word of God is true then and it's true now. If the Word of God is not true in this area, how can we trust it in other areas of life? The word submit doesn't mean to subjugate yourself. It's not servitude or slavery. The word submit means to arrange yourself in rank or order. In fact, it's a military term that means to arrange under rank. And so the private is not a private just because uh, the colonel's a better person. No, the private is a private because there's the rank, there's an order. And there has to be an order to everything that we see in society. The Bible tells us, wives, submit to your husbands. What does that mean? Well, in every area of life, we see that there's order, there's submission, there's headship. Even in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that the Son of God does nothing unless it's the will of the Father. Jesus is equally God, but chooses to submit to the will of God the Father. At work, at home, in your marriage, God has a divine design and order. In fact, what you don't know or what you might not know is that Paul's words are radical and revolutionary in his day because he's teaching, he's speaking to a culture that subjugated women that treated women like property. Do you know that in Jewish law, in Greek law, in the society of the day, women had no legal rights whatsoever. They had no legal rights. They were not allowed to go out in the public square by themselves, not even to go to the market. The husband could be sexually unfaithful multiple times, but the woman could be put to death if she did the same thing. Paul's writing in the midst of that culture, and so what you notice is Paul actually elevates the plight of women. He elevates the situation. He values them. He values children. Puts into effect here, the, the, the mo in motion, to sabotage slavery. Paul's beginning to lift up the family and to establish the Christian ethic. Now, husbands, we have to understand something very important. Husbands are called to be the head of the home. We have a greater responsibility. We're called to love our wives, Ephesians says, as Christ loved the church. You see, headship is not lordship. It's not dictatorship. It's loving leadership. And we're called to love and to lead by example. We've got to embrace God's model for marriage. I heard about a little girl who was talking to one of her elderly neighbors one day. And this elderly neighbor lady was very impressed. She was having a conversation with this little girl. And she wanted to impress this little girl because she wanted to talk about Cinderella. The little girl was talking about Cinderella. And the, the, the neighbor lady 
she wanted to impress this little girl because she knew all about Cinderella. And they went back and forth about the slipper and it fit and, and, and all the, you know, turning into a pumpkin and all the details about Cinderella. And then the old lady said, the old elderly neighbor said to the little girl, she said, and of course, they lived happily ever after. The little girl looked up at the elderly neighbor and said, no, they didn't. They got married. <laughs> That's the way a lot of people view marriage, isn't it? That's the way a lot of people view marriage. Listen carefully. If your marriage is designed to make you compete with one another instead of complete one another, you've got a problem. The Bible says when God made Eve, he made a helper fit. The word is complete. God designed marriage for two to become one. And if with Christ as the center, we can walk in that fulfillment, we can walk in the joy of marriage. You see, Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands, but husbands love your wives. Believe it or not, the call to the husband is even more radical than the call to the wife. The parallel passage in Ephesians 6 explains this very clearly. Just a few pages back in Ephesians chapter 6, and, or Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 25 to 28, listen to what the, the requirements are for the husband. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Do you are the standard for the men? And let me just be very honest with you. The call to the husband is even more radical and revolutionary than the call to the wife. In those days, husbands treated their wives like property. Paul says, you want to know how to love your wife, you want to know how to have a good marriage, you love your wife like Christ loved the church. You sacrifice for her. You be selfless. You lead. You love. You sanctify her. Paul's challenging the men to take the role of headship and leadership in the home. And by the way, husbands, let me just say, being the head of the home has nothing to do with who does the dishes, who vacuums, who does the laundry, or who dusts. You're welcome, ladies. It has nothing to do with any of that. Do you want to know what being the head of the home means? It means that you are responsible under God for the spiritual well-being of your wife and your family. It means you are to lovingly lead them to the cross, lead them to Christ daily. I heard a story about a preacher who was marrying a young couple, and of course he gets up and says, if anyone objects, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. All of a sudden, over the quiet of the crowd, there was a voice that said, I object, I object, I object. The preacher looked and said, you can't object, you're the groom. <laughs> we have so many different ideas about marriage, about God's design and God's plan. But let me promise you something. A husband that lovingly leads and loves like Christ loved the church will be amazed to find a wife who willingly submits to his spiritual leadership. It is a beautiful and amazing thing. We need to learn to embrace God's model for marriage. You know, I'm, I'm learning. I have two boys first, okay? And, and boys are, you know, football and tackling and punching and kicking. And, and then I have three girls. So I've got two boys and three girls. Nine, seven, six, almost four, and one, all right? There's a reason we call it beautiful chaos, you know? But I'm learning how to braid hair. You'd be so... And, and I'm learning. I can do two types of braids. Anna Kate calls them Elsa braids or Anna braids, if you've seen the movie Frozen, Elsa has one braid in the middle and Anna has two braids along the side. I can braid hair. I don't braid hair as good as their mama braids hair. And Anna Kate, our six-year-old, can braid her sister's hair. It's impressive. But I've learned to braid hair. You know what I learned about braiding hair? When you see a braid, it looks like there's only two pieces that are interwoven, right? That's what it looks like. But you're not going to be able to braid two pieces. That's not a braid. It's a twist. And it doesn't work. You have to have three parts to be able to braid the hair. But it only looks like two. 
And I would say a good marriage may only look like they're two parts, but they're really three. God is the invisible center that holds you together, that, that, that weaves you together with your spouse, with your mate, so that you can be the couple that God desires you to be. Embrace God's model for marriage. Don't reject it because society says you ought to be more or expect more. Look, God knows best. And if you want a marriage that honors God, that fulfills you, that brings you joy, and that leads you down the right path, follow God's model, embrace it, and you will find joy in your marriage like you never expected. And some people say marriage is just about three rings. The engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffering. <laughs> marriage is about so much more than that, okay? Marriage is about so much more than that. And, and the truth is, the sad part of that joke is, it's true for so many people. I expected so much different. And now, look at what I've got. Well, what, what's happened is, you begin to remove those planks from the bottom. And everything just ends up in a mess. Follow God's plan. Embrace it. And husbands, let me just say this before I move on. I'm not saying this never happens. But I'm saying in my ministry, over 10 years as a senior pastor, I've been in ministry since I was 17 years old. Coming on 20 years soon. In my ministry counseling couples, I have rarely found, rarely found a wife who is unwilling to submit to Christ-like, loving leadership in the home. It is incredibly rare. If you're having problems in your relationship, don't focus on what the other person needs to do. Focus on what you need to do. Husband, you need to learn to love your wife like Christ loved the church. You step out and be like, well, I'm waiting for her to do this. No, don't wait. Do it. Love her like Christ loved the church. And watch what God does in that relationship. Embrace God's model for marriage. Secondly, apply God's principles for parenting. Apply God's principles for parenting. I'm so grateful the Bible meets us right where we are. I'm so thankful the Bible is an incredibly practical book. The Bible helps us. You know what? You know what I've discovered as a father of five children? You know what I've discovered? I need help. I need help. And the Bible helps me. You know what I know about you too? You need help. I'll just go ahead and say that with me. Say, I need help. So some of you wouldn't say it. Say it again. I need help. I know you do. And I do too. We all need help. This is why the Bible meets us right where we are. It's incredibly practical. I desperately need help. I can't do it on my own. There's so much I have to learn. So many ways that I have to grow. I need to apply God's principles for parenting. What does he say? First, let's look at the instruction to the children. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, the children would like a whole lot more qualifiers in that sentence. Children, obey your parents in everything, unless it has to do with calculus homework. Children, obey your parents in everything, unless they want to take your smartphone away, right? Children, obey your parents in everything, unless they're making you eat Brussels sprouts, you know? But that's not what it says. It tells us what? tells us who, tells us why, tells us when. Who? Children. Children, and specifically the word in the Greek, lends itself to interpret it this way. Those who are still in the household of their parents. Now there's more instruction throughout scripture that we're to always honor our father and mother. But here specifically it's speaking to those children who are under the roof of their parents. Children, now what are you to do? Obey your parents when in everything. Why? For this pleases the Lord. Ah, oh, it's this idea of submission once again. You want relationships that work, you've got to learn that God is a God of order, not a God of chaos, that he arranges things in order. That the mom and the dad, the husband and the wife, are the leaders in the home. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now there's a, a parallel passage in Ephesians 6.1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then it goes on to say something very interesting. That you may live long in the land, that you may prosper. What does that mean? Children, obey your parents in everything so your parents won't kill you. That's what it means, all right? I'm helping you here, okay? Literally what it means is if you want God's favor and blessing 
anointing on your life. Follow God's plan for your life in every area, whether it's the husband and the wife, whether it's the parents and the children, whether it's the employer and the employee, in every area of life, follow God's plan. Children, obey your parents in everything. There's one exception. I saw you perk up just then. There's one exception. If what they tell you to do directly contradicts the word of God, we must obey God rather than men. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean if what they tell you to do contradicts your present desires. Well, I want to go to the game. Well, I want to go to the movies. Well, I want to do this. I want to do that. No, children, obey your parents. Submit lovingly to their authority for this is right. It pleases the Lord and everything. And then it talks to parents, specifically here in verse 21. Read 21 with me. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. The word fathers there is actually better translated parents. Parents, love your children. Parents, do not provoke your children so that they are not discouraged. You see, let me tell you, uh, Ephesians 6 uses the word exasperated. They become frustrated. They throw their hands up and they say, nothing I do works. Parents, this is a great truth. I'm going to tell you two ways that you provoke your children, two ways that you exasperate your children, and these are two extremes. The first way to exasperate your son or your daughter is to indulge them. You give them everything they want, and you will be certain to raise a rotten, spoiled brat. The first way to exasperate your child is to indulge them, to give them everything they could ever desire. You've seen the parents. Their whole world is wrapped up in their son or their daughter and whatever competition or whatever sporting event or whatever ac academic endeavor or whatever. And so the parents are all about the kids. Everything centers around them. That's their whole world. They always pay attention to what you want. They always do everything that you say. They're always all about you. You want to raise somebody that can't function in society. Mom and dad, make sure that they're the center of your world. They'll grow up thinking they really are the center of the world. They're not. The first way to exasperate your children is to indulge them, to give them everything they want. That is the surefire way to raise a rotten adult. You, you want to know another way to exasperate your children? Ignore them. These are two extremes. You've got some parents, and they can't go... They can't go 30 minutes without checking on their son or daughter, or they can't go 30 minutes without wondering. Or they, they're, Everything they do is centered up in that child. Then you've got other parents who couldn't care less. Can I go out? I don't care what you do. Can I go spend the night? I don't care. Can I have this? Doesn't matter to me. Come on, yeah, you can have your friends over. I'll buy you alcohol. It's no big deal. Well, that's the kind of parent that raises a child that thinks they're worth nothing, and they grow up to resent their parents. You see, you set boundaries. You love them. You lead them, but don't exa exasperate them. Don't provoke them to anger. Don't give them everything they want. You'll ruin them, but don't ignore them. Love them. You let them know. Hey, I love you. I want what's best for you. And that means that you don't get everything you want. That means that sometimes I'm going to say no because I'm mom, I'm dad, and I can say no. Get over it. It means sometimes I'm going to give you some things that you don't deserve because I love you. And I want to help you. And I want to teach you. You see, when you apply God's principles for parenting, it is absolutely amazing. Parents, don't exasperate. Don't provoke your children. Learn to love them. Learn to lead them. I heard a story about a man who was a professor and he taught a family ethics course. He was a single man as he began. And so he had a lesson on parenting. And it was, uh, it, it, the lesson was titled, Ten Commandments for Parenting. Then he had his first kid. And he changed the lecture title, 10 Hints for Parenting. Then he had his second kid. He changed it again, 10 Suggestions for Parenting. Then his third kid, he just quit teaching altogether. You want to know somebody who's an expert on parenting? I'll tell you somebody who's an expert on parenting, somebody who doesn't have kids. Okay? That is an expert on parenting. You think you know everything until they show up and you realize quickly how much you don't know. It's a lifelong process of learning and of growing and of learning and of growing. And sometimes the learning and growing involves a few tears here and there. Your tears or their tears. Mark it down, somebody's going to cry. 
But it's a lifelong process. And when we apply, listen, let me tell you the type of home the Christian home ought to be. Ought to have a loving heart, a watchful eye, a listening ear, and a helpful hand. That's a great picture of what a Christian home should be. And then finally we see God's way at work. So we ought to follow God's way at work. So number one, embrace God's model for marriage. Number two, apply God's principles for parenting. And number three, follow God's way at work. Follow God's way at work. Now, Paul begins talking about slaves and masters, about bond servants. About 60 million people in the Roman Empire were slaves. That's almost 50% of the population. It was all over the place. But in the Roman Empire, slavery was very different than it was in American history. Slavery was not racially based. It was much more of a socioeconomic status, socioeconomic class. And so depending upon whether you owed money to someone, you'd become their slave in order to pay off that debt. Or sometimes they would own you as a slave. And if you'll notice here, Paul doesn't do anything specifically in this text to try to tear down slavery in the Roman Empire. He's not going after something political. He uses the gospel of Jesus Christ. Read the book of Philemon. What you'll notice is Paul tells Onesimus to receive this slave as he would a brother in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what happened is the ethic of Christianity ultimately sabotaged slavery altogether. But here the relationship can be very much compared to that of employers and employees. A little bit different for sure, but it gives us an idea of what it's like to be who God wants us to be at work. Now, I would venture to guess that most of you, at least maybe all of you, have worked at some time or another in your life. So you were an employee and you had an employer, and listen to what the Bible says. First of all, the command to masters, bosses, chapter 4 and verse 1, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you have a master in heaven. What does that mean? If you're a boss, you need to understand that you're not the big boss, that God is the big boss. You have a master in heaven, and you are accountable to him and responsible to him. One day you'll stand before Jesus, and there'll be a payday. Then he gives instruction to those of us who are workers. He says three specific things. If you'll, if you'll look at the text, verses 23 and 24, read the text with me very quickly. Whatever you do, well, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you'll receive your inheritance and your reward. Back up to the first part of verse 22. We're given an instruction. Work submissively. Stay bond servants, obey in everything. Employers, obey. Follow God's arranged order. Secondly, work sincerely. The second part of verse 22. With sincerity of heart. Not just when the boss is looking, but in all things. Here's what he says. Not just eye service, not just people pleasers. Don't just learn to look busy, but to do what you're supposed to do. And then he says work spiritually. Understand this. You work for God, not man. He says here, once again, important, verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So ultimately, you may love your boss, you may not. You may love your job, you may not. You may love what you do, you may not. But in the end, this is a way for you to bring honor and glory to the Lord. In everything you do, work heartily as unto the Lord. In everything you do. The statistics show us that less than 43% of Americans are satisfied with their jobs. In Japan, the number drops to 17%. Less than 17% satisfied with their job. You, you've heard the, the bumper sticker ethic, right? I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. You've heard that before? That's the way we treat our job. But let me tell you what you ought to do. You ought to treat your job like this. This is a ministry. This is is a mission field. This is a calling. And I'm going to do it with everything I've got. I'm going to work heartily as unto the Lord. I heard a story about two guys walking down the road. They looked over to business and they saw a sign that said, no help wanted. One friend looked at the other and said, man, you'd be perfect for that. You're no help at all. <laughs> what kind of employee are you? Are you one who lives for the Lord let me just be honest with you. One of the greatest mission fields that you'll ever step foot on is your home 
and your job. Your home and your job. So learn in every area of life to live a life that pleases the Lord and honors Him. This is what it means, relationships that work. And here's, here's our problem. We're almost done. We keep yanking blocks out underneath thinking everything at the top is going to be just fine. Don't have time for church. Got to go here, got to go there. Kids doing this, daughters doing that, sons going here, playing ball. So we yank out our church attendance. We don't have time to spend time in the Word or to pray, so we yank that out. And, and we're confused and concerned, and we question God when everything else in life just starts falling apart. It's our fault. We've done this. And so we have to learn, once again, how to put that foundation back in place to build a life that works and relationships that matter.